Hi, my name is Matthew Persick, and I will be presenting on endovascular aortic aneurysm repair. I am a former cardiovascular ICU nurse, currently attend the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh for my doctorate in nursing practice with an anesthesia emphasis, and will become a future certified registered nurse anesthetist in May of 2021. Nurse anesthetists have been on the front lines providing safe and quality anesthesia care in all different healthcare settings for over a century. Their presence in both military and civilian life has afforded millions of patients across the United States increased access to excellent anesthesia care each year. During the COVID-19 pandemic, they have continued to be fully immersed in delivering excellent care to all. I'm excited and honored to become a nurse anesthetist. An endovascular aneurysm repair, or EVAR, is a minimally invasive endovascular stent graft deployed within the aortic lumen, which restricts blood flow to the weakened walls of the aneurysm. Most often, both femoral arteries are cannulated. However, sometimes the brachial or subclavian artery is utilized instead. Once the artery is cannulated, the guide wire is threaded to the aneurysm through the iliac artery and a sheath is inserted over the guide wire via fluoroscopy. The sheath is then deployed and the stent is embedded into the wall of the aorta. When compared to an open surgical repair of an aortic aneurysm, an EVAR provides numerous benefits. Intraoperatively, there is a decrease in the length of procedure, the need for blood products or transfusion, an absence of aortic cross clamping, less hemodynamic instability, and a decrease in stress response and renal impairment. Postoperatively, there is an absence of a large incision that would extend from the xiphoid process to the pubis, a decreased incidence of paraplegia and spinal cord ischemia, a decrease in postoperative discomfort and length of hospital stay, and a decrease in 30-day mortality rate. However, this procedure tends to be associated with more expense as lifelong monitoring is mandatory and reinterventions are likely. The patient population that presents for aortic aneurysm repair is usually accompanied by various comorbidities and risk factors that may make anesthesia management more difficult. Advanced age, hypertension, heart disease, history of smoking, and COPD are all common comorbidities associated with this patient population. Due to its minimally invasive nature, the endovascular technique is now a treatment of choice for a majority of patients with aortic aneurysms and provides the greatest benefit to high-risk patients with cardiovascular, pulmonary, and renal dysfunction. A comprehensive preoperative assessment, identification of high-risk patients, and optimization prior to the procedure is vital for creating a safe and effective anesthesia plan. The main preoperative anesthetic considerations are identifying high-risk patients and optimizing them prior to the procedure. If patients present with an extensive smoking history or severe COPD, arterial blood gas monitoring can help predict risk for intra- and post-operative respiratory complications and ventilation status. If patients present with a poor functional capacity, a non-invasive stress test can help identify risk for perioperative adverse cardiac events. Optimizing the patient as far prior to the procedure as possible can help decrease adverse outcomes. It is recommended to place high-risk patients on an aspirin, beta blocker, and statin regimen to help prevent perioperative complications such as MI and stroke. The endovascular procedure requires seamless communication between the vascular surgeon, interventional radiologist, and the anesthesia provider, both pre- and intraoperatively, to ensure quality care of the patient. Intraoperatively, the anesthesia provider must prepare for the procedure to take place either in a traditional OR or in an IR suite and ensure all necessary anesthesia and emergency equipment are readily available. The anesthesia provider should also prepare for anticoagulation of the patient and possible induction of mild hypotension during stent deployment if requested by the surgeon. Because of the use of fluoroscopy, equipment for protection from radiation exposure must be present such as lead aprons, screens, and thyroid shields. For the anesthesia provider, the main goals for this procedure are to maintain hemodynamic stability, myocardial oxygen supply and demand, perfusion to vital organs in the spinal cord, identifying and managing intraoperative complications such as bleeding, and maintaining normal thermia. When selecting the anesthetic technique, consider the complexity of the aneurysm and presenting comorbidities of the patient, the procedure length, which is usually greater than four hours, the patient's coagulation status, their ability to remain supine for extended period of time, and the preferred choice of the patient and surgical team. General, neuraxial, and local anesthesia with sedation can be successfully implemented for this procedure. 
However, general anesthesia is most frequently performed due to patients frequently anticoagulated pre- and intraoperatively, easier achievement of hemodynamic stability and titration of agents, a secured airway in case of rupture or need to convert to open, control of ventilation to improve image quality, and duration of procedure. Although general anesthesia is performed most often, neuraxial and local anesthesia with sedation can be more advantageous for high-risk patients due to avoidance of mechanical ventilation, decreased inflammatory and stress response, and adequate postoperative analgesia coverage. Monitoring and anesthetic management for an EVAR procedure involve use of a 5-lead ECG to monitor for myocardial ischemia and routine placement of a radial artery catheter on the right side for continuous hemodynamic monitoring and drawing labs, while also avoiding possible cannulation site of the left brachial artery. Two large bore IVs should be inserted and fluids, blood, and a rapid transfuser should be readily available in case of significant blood loss and the need to administer fluids rapidly. The anesthesia provider should check a baseline ACT prior to anticoagulation, another ACT three minutes after heparin administration, and again every 30 minutes after to maintain a goal anticoagulation status of 2 to 2.5 times baseline after cannulation. Protamine administration may be required for reversal at the end of the procedure. Maintaining normal bulimia can help minimize renal insult from the large dose contrast used during fluoroscopy. The location of the aneurysm may also necessitate the need for TEE monitoring and induced hypotension during stent placement, as seen during descending thoracic aneurysm repairs. After the procedure, these patients will recover in the ICU for continuous monitoring and assessment. The complications associated with an EVAR procedure can be divided into early and late. Early complications include primary endoleaks, vessel trauma, lower extremity ischemia, aneurysm rupture, or acute renal failure, MI, or stroke. Additionally, paraplegia and post-implantation syndrome can also occur. Since the artery of Adamkovich arises from the aorta most commonly between T9 and T12, it is at greater risk for occlusion by suprarenal stent grafts, leading to paraplegia. To help prevent spinal cord ischemia, CSF drainage, maintenance of perfusion, steroids, and hypothermia can all be utilized. However, maintaining cardiac output and short procedure times are the only definitive methods. Post-implantation syndrome, characterized by clinical manifestations of sepsis, such as pyrexia, leukocytosis, and increased inflammatory markers, but without evidence of infection, is usually a self-limiting and most often benign complication. However, it may take two weeks to resolve, extending the length of hospital stay for patients. Late complications are most often related to endoleaks. Endoleaks occur when complete exclusion of arterial blood flow from the aneurysm sac cannot be maintained. This can lead to re-enlargement of the sac and eventual rupture. Type 2 endoleaks are most common and involve retrograde filling of blood from surrounding arteries into the aneurysm sac. Treatment ranges from observation to immediate surgical treatment, depending on the type of endoleak. Type 2 and type 4 endoleaks usually are maintained through observation, while type 1 and type 3 are treated aggressively with surgical intervention. Either way, mandatory lifelong surveillance and imaging is required for patients who undergo an EVAR procedure, as complications leading to reintervention at some point in their life are as high as 20%. Controversies still exist as to the long-term benefits from morbidity and mortality of the endovascular technique compared to an open surgical repair. As previously stated, EVAR has been proven to decrease 30-day mortality rate in high-risk patients undergoing aortic aneurysm repair. However, studies have shown little evidence to support any intermediate or long-term advantage over an open surgical technique. According to a randomized study performed by Letterly and colleagues, which involved 881 patients who were candidates for either procedure, results showed that overall survival rate insignificantly trended between the two procedures between the first four years, from year four through year eight, and again after eight years. The researchers reached the conclusion that long-term overall survival rate was similar among both groups. 
However, a statistically significant increased rate of secondary procedures were noted in patients who underwent an EBAR procedure. Thank you for viewing and listening to my presentation. I hope you enjoyed.